So uh, we're going to start with uh, Mike Schmerder from, uh, from Cook Aquaculture. Um, Cook Aquaculture is a tremendous story. Um, they started in 1985 with one cage and 5,000 fish, and they now employ over 2,000 people around the world. Um, and uh, really their hallmark as a company um, is that they work very hard. Um, they are very vested in the communities in which they operate in. We've really seen that in Maine. We've seen them uh, give back to those communities and say what they, uh, and do what they said they were gonna do. Um, and they have built a team internationally uh, that's quite amazing. In fact, it, uh, the, the company and uh, the evolution of that company is so amazing that at the uh, Brussels Seafood Show, which is going on right now, Glenn Cook, one of the, the two brothers and the, and the father of the, of the family that founded uh, the company was recognized as the Interfish uh, Person of the Year. That's quite uh, an achievement. Uh, Interfish is the preeminent trade uh, publications group in aquaculture internationally. And when they picked Glenn, uh, the interesting thing was they said that normally this is a very tough pick. There are a lot of talented CEOs <coughs> in our field um, and we have a hard time making that choice. In the, case of, in the case of Glenn Cook, it was a no-brainer. There was no debate amongst the jury in terms of whether or not Glenn should be nominated or not. And the reason for that is the speed with which he has grown that company um, and the uh, dedication that the family has shown uh, to the people who work for them and to the countries that they work in. So without further ado, uh, Mike Schmurter, VP for Operations with uh, Cook Aquaculture. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come and speak. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the company, uh, take you through what we do, especially here in the Northeast, uh, a little bit of our global operations, and then uh, go into some of the ocean technology, some of the technology that we put in place in order for us to be able to continue to grow in this industry, and then wrap it up at the end uh, with, uh, of course, our linkages to research and the importance that we have uh, in doing so. So just a little bit of background on aquaculture, of course, uh, we all know the uh, global population is going to expect to rise uh, by 2 billion by uh, 2050. The world uh, food supply needs to double by then. So what's that mean? That means that the amount of food that will be consumed in the world in the next 50 years will exceed all the food eaten from the beginning till now. That's pretty staggering. Over the next 50 years, more food will be consumed than what we've already consumed from the beginning until now. Um, a, lot of that, uh, a lot of that food will have to come from the sea, as Sebastian has already stated. Uh, farm fish has now surpassed uh, beef and worldwide consumption. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know that, so that's a, that's a good statistic to throw out. More than 50% of all fish consumed in the world come from aquaculture. Uh, we, we have to learn to grow. Uh, I think the, the wild capture fisheries, which I was a part of uh, growing up, uh, has you know, reached a limit where they can be sustainable, but you can't really grow it a whole lot. So you have, to, um, you have to rely on other ways to get your seafood from the oceans and, and your resources. And, and one of those ways is aquaculture. So aquaculture is uh, crucial uh, for meeting the needs uh, for the next 50 years and beyond. So I usually throw this up. Uh, this is an eyed salmon egg, and we usually use it for a metaphor for our company, Cook Aquaculture. So obviously we started very small, uh, and we multiply many times as we grow through many, many challenges. And I would add uh, one thing to the metaphor. I believe that's also the, the case for this region. So from Atlantic Canada to New England, specifically in Maine, um, we are very small globally. When you look around, uh, you know, we, we geographically we have a little bit of a wide area. We have a lot of coastline, but population-wise, we're we're fairly small. However, we can grow in uh, ocean technologies, and we have grown, and we have a lot of expertise. And I think that you know we have a lot of challenges, but I think we can grow and 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 thrive in in not only this industry, but be leaders in the world in in this industry in, in ocean technology. So Cook Aquaculture, uh, we're a diverse and integrated company. We had started, as Sebastian said, with uh, one cage of fish back in 1985, uh, but Glenn quickly had a vision 
that uh, we needed to be able to supply ourselves. And of course, we were on the East Coast, and like many East Coasters, um, we are blue collar people. We put our head down, we get the work done, get up early, get your job done, go home, enjoy your family. Those are the, you know, the, uh, what we live by, I guess, on the East Coast. When you look around, we're not very different from all the way from New England up into uh, Newfoundland. We couldn't rely on outside people because there wasn't a lot of contracts. If you went to Norway in the industry when it started up, there was a lot of contract companies that started up that would come in and, and say, change your nets for you, or they would build your cages. There was nobody to help supply it, so we had to build it on our own. So we became a vertically integrated company. So currently, right now, we have our own broodstock program. We keep our own broodstock on land. We, we have our own freshwater hatcheries. We have, of course, all of our own sites. We have our own harvest boats. We have our own processing plants. We make our own styrofoam for boxes for our, our uh, processing plants. We make our own feed for our fish. Uh, we do our own trucking. We have 35 transport trucks that uh, ship uh, seafood all around the country. Um, so we built a fully integrated company because we wanted to be able to control uh, the chain the whole way through. And that, that philosophy has, as we expanded uh, globally, has followed us into different areas. Although we haven't been fully integrated in all the areas that we're in, that's the, the model that we're trying to follow. So we have expanded into, um, into Chile. Uh, we have operations in the south in Region 11 in Chile. Uh, in 2014, we expanded into Scotland uh, with salmon uh, sites on the Orkney and Shetland Islands. Uh, we have expanded, I think it was 2000, uh, my mind's 2008, I think. Uh, that we had purchased uh, Kumarex, which is a sea bass sea bream operation in Spain, and we were able to uh, double that company's output now. And so we're the largest uh, sea bass sea bream grower in Spain at this time. Uh, then, uh, I think it's next slide. Yeah, so I'll get to that in a sec. So this is basically our operations. It's kind of hard to see in uh, North America, as you can see, all the way down into Maine, all the way out to Aquasic, out by the border. Um, uh, where we have freshwater facilities, our processing plant in Machias, and then we have, of course, sites and hatcheries and processing plants all through Atlantic Canada, all the way into Newfoundland, up as far as uh, uh, Daniels Harbor. Uh, as you see up on the peninsula there, we have hatchery up there and, and growing sites down on the south coast. So we're, we're all over um, the northeast, and uh, we're proud to say that we work in a lot of rural com communities. We're, we're not urban. Uh, we want to keep the uh, growing and keep the jobs where they belong, back in the, in the rural communities and keep people working. So uh, last year we, we uh, ventured more into the wild fishery with a purchase of Juan Cheese Fisheries in, in Virginia, South Folk, Virginia. This allowed us to, to get a fleet of, I think it was 14 scallop, uh, offshore scallop boats, uh, processing plant, cold storage facilities. Uh, distribution uh, as well as a, a couple of offshore uh, scallop boats in Argentina and, and so that was our big or sticking our foot into the wild fishery uh, side to help diversify every time we we have an acquisition it's really to diversify risk to to allow us to we, we expand into Chile to diversify geographically uh, we're still doing Atlantic salmon something we were comfortable with but we we're doing it uh, in a different region same thing with Scotland Spain was about diversifying species, allowing us on geographically and species-wide to diversify. This, again, is just a, a way to, uh, Wanchis was a family-owned business, been in the family for, for many, many years. Uh, it fit very well with the Cook Agriculture family. And so we formed Cook Agriculture Seafood USA and, uh, and now operating out of Southfolk. So as I said, we're fully integrated. So we do where we try to keep everything in house as far as our uh, farming operations go. We have our, and, and you can tell we have our own uh, labs. We have our own. We basically try to do everything that we can. We have our own uh, uh, marketing, sales teams all over uh, all over the country. Um, yeah. So operations in the Northeast. Uh, we operate in a, a very challenging environment, and that's why. A lot of us are here. Obviously, we uh, we're talking about ocean technologies and and how things are changing in the ocean. What's coming up and new? How we can collaborate on research to make things better. Well, we operate in in uh, challenging here in Maine and in uh, Atlantic Canada. We have uh, lots of winter conditions. We have conditions that, uh, to be quite frank, nobody else in the world wants to farm in, uh, and 
sometimes I don't blame them. <laughs> uh, when I visit the West Coast and I, you know, visit Norway and, and uh, even our operations in Scotland, and they're all complaining because their winter temperatures uh, of their, uh, their ocean went down to eight degrees. I'm looking at them like, you know, okay, we're battling, uh, you know, winter conditions in Newfoundland. I mean, we're still only at 1.5 degrees for our uh, oceans there. So it's, uh, you know, it's a challenging condition for sure. So for us, it's, it's about learning and it's about uh, getting better because when you're facing harsher environments, and as I said before, uh, when we were talking about the analogy of the salmon egg and growing and meeting many challenges as they were going, this is some of the challenges we have grown as a company as we, we have gotten bigger. We, we knew we had to uh, innovate and, and get better. So um, one of the other things that we do a lot of, of course, uh, primarily we're farmers. We farm fish. We have to take care of our stock. Uh, we need to understand what's going on in our environment in order to make the right choices. So. This is just a, a, a little snapshot, a screenshot off of one of the monitoring stations we have uh, working uh, with Vemco out of Nova Scotia, uh, basically uh, putting temperature and oxygen uh, meters in each of the cages so that we can monitor if something's going on. Uh, usually you can, uh, you, can, you can plot out, you have, basically we have alarms on it in case they go down farther so that we can, if we need to, add aeration or uh, and, and so it's, to me it's important to have the real-time information so that we can make decisions in order to better the stock. But it's also very, very important to have long-term data sets so that we can see trends in, in what's going on in the world. And I know a lot of people are doing research in uh, ocean acidity, uh, temperatures, global warming, um, how the ocean conditions are changing. And a lot of it's taking place offshore. Um, and we're, we're kind of missing that um, that, that gap between the, the interface between the land and the, say the 10 miles offshore. And, and it's, I think it's important for us to, uh, to fill that gap. And that means adding any time or any chance we can get long-term data sets and add it to a, a facility that would allow people to be able to go in and see the data and do measurements off of. And, and I will mention uh, NIRCUS, I know Tom's here. Uh, so that's the Northeast Regional Association of Ocean Observation Systems, uh, Integrated Ocean Observation Systems. Um, and, and they've taken over uh, the Go Moves buoys that used to be the part of the University of Maine and uh, allowing um, important long-term data sets to be available to researchers and people who are studying ocean uh, conditions and uh, allowing that research to happen. So it, to me, it's very important that we, any chance we get that we are collecting data, to put it in a format that gets recorded and that people have access to it to allow them to be used. This is just another uh, section. We do a lot of readings uh, wherever we operate and wherever we intend to try to expand to. This is just a, a wave meter that we had out. And uh, unfortunately, we only had it out for six days. Uh, we never actually had uh, a big wind event but they did, they did go up to six meter waves in, on our farm and then uh, the meter broke. So <laughs> unfortunately, that's what we get. <laughs> uh, sometimes that happens. Um, you know, as, uh, as I said before, obviously, you know, we're, we're a fairly large company now. Uh, overall, worldwide, we're, we're pushing a, a, a billion dollars in sales. And, uh, but it's, it's important for us here in the Northeast to keep, uh, you know, we, we do about uh, 45 to 50,000 metric tons of Atlantic salmon between Maine and, and uh, Atlantic Canada. And you know, our job is to keep those fish healthy and happy until they're, they're gone to market. Uh, so we, we have to invest big money into capital, big money into uh, technology in order for us to be able to maintain the, the health of the fish. Uh, this is just some of the uh, pictures of the, one of the, two of the well boats. Uh, that we had purchased in order to uh, allow us to, uh, to be able to treat fish, count fish, um, move fish uh, more efficiently and uh, with greater care. Um, harvest vessels, we've put a lot of work into uh, being uh, at the forefront of harvest technologies and, and that's for a couple of reasons. One was obviously uh, humane reasons. We wanted to make sure that, you know, we grow these fish, we want to make sure at the end, at the very end before they go to market that they're getting treated the very best before they're harvested so that we have a quality product that goes to, uh, to our customers. The other um, obviously is efficiency, 
And uh, we also had, had uh, uh, the UK Humane Society come in, audit our systems to make sure that they, they had agreed with uh, our methods. And, and as we all know, social uh, acceptance or license, uh, I kind of hate that term, but anyway, I'll use it, uh, social license to operate, because we are in a public domain, it is important uh, to, a, to an extent. People need to, in, in my opinion, people need to understand what we're doing. And a lot of times misinformation gets out there and then opinions are set before they actually hear the real information. So it's, it's very difficult to change somebody's opinion if they've heard misinformation rather than tell them the real information first. So I always encourage people, if you want to know more about our farms or about us, come on out. You know, we enjoy taking people out and, and educating, showing them exactly what's being done. We have really nothing to hide. Uh, we're, we take great pride, and the people who work on those farms, if you're here in Maine, if you go to one of the farms, uh, you will see that all over the faces of the people that work on those farms. Uh, so feeding technology. Uh, this is uh, one of our newer 300-ton feed barges. Um, this is a site in, in uh, Digby in Nova Scotia. However, uh, two of those barges are coming into Maine this year um, to help facilitate, you know, upgrade some of the capital that we have. This allows us to be, uh, to feed the fish more efficiently. Uh, they're all run off uh, blowers. The technology for this is continuously changing, you know, the, the PCL, uh, the PLCs, the, uh, the engineering behind it, uh, how to best deliver feed to, to, to be quiet but efficient. Uh, as you can see, there's cameras in the bottom part, there's cameras in every cage. The people who are feeding are trained. Uh, to look at animal behavior, not necessarily just looking for specks on, 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 the, uh, on the screen. So they're looking at how the fish are swimming, how they're behaving, uh, and then judging how much feed they're taking in order for us not to waste any feed. And that's, of course, two, twofold. One is, obviously, it wouldn't be uh, you're adding nutrients to the environment if you're adding wasted feed. Two is you're wasting a lot of money. You don't want to do that. We want to stay in business long term and be sustainable. So we, we've invested a lot of money into to, uh, feeding technologies. Uh, cage design. Although you may think that you know a plastic circle is a plastic circle and uh, nothing much has changed over the years, uh, believe you me, a lot of things have changed uh, in, 20, in the last 20 years in the cage design. Uh, the one thing I'll, you know, I'll point out on this, uh, we deal mostly with uh, what we call 100 meter uh, plastic circle cages, uh, high density polyethylene uh, plastic circle cages, and that means a 100 meter circumference. Um, when Polar Circle was one of the first companies, a Norwegian company, when they first came over and built them, they, they basically, and I'll get into too much detail, but they basically had a plate and the post went straight up. The first winter we had, the ice built up, everything collapsed inside, turned inside out. So uh, we quickly realized that we are working in a harsher environment and we had to make some changes. So we ended up putting, uh, you know, adjusting the, the braces and uh, I'll get a, a little more close up. So what we do now is, of course, we, we get all of our components engineered, drawn, we run it through the model, a finite model, make sure where the weak points are, then address those weak points, go back, refine. And a lot of work goes into one little brace, let me tell you. But it's paid off because we've, we, in the last couple of years, we have not had a failure on any brace, on any cage, in, in any of the conditions that we farm in. So this is um, basically one of the kind of the older style braces where we did the, the 45, we kind of switched around. This is what we call uh, our beefy bracket and, and it's like basically twice the size so every fourth bracket on our offshore cages now have what we call this beefy bracket. Again a lot of work's gone into it but it's, uh, it, it's one of those things that you put it out on the site and it looks to people who don't know it looks exactly the same as it did 20 years ago. Well it has changed and we do put a lot of technology into it. So everything that we put on the water is, uh, is basically drawn to spec. Uh, we have uh, we have everything uh, installed according to to our drawings, uh, so that we're consistent wherever we are. We're always putting things in the same way. We don't uh, we don't want to be have a, a bunch of different specs. So on this farm, we may not run into as uh, high conditions, say as uh, tidal energy may not be as high on this site. Well, we're going to use less uh, less uh, hardware on this site because of that. We prefer to keep the one standard, then if anything happens, everybody's used to working on it. So we build everything to the highest standard, and if the energy doesn't uh, 
needed on that site, it'll just last longer. So um, two minutes, two minutes. We'll keep, we, don't, we only got 14 more slides. We're good. Uh, You're killing me. <laughs> Um, one of the biggest changes uh, yeah, I've seen in the industry in 25 years is really over the last couple of years we've really started to, uh, to uh, investigate and change uh, the netting that we've used on the cages. And I'll just quickly say this is a star K is uh, kind of what they uh, call this one. It's, uh, it's more of a poly material, but it very mimics nylon a lot. Nylon is what we used to use, and, and I won't get into why nylon. We had challenges with it. Uh, let's just say the main point is we had to use an anti-fouling on it in order to, uh, to keep the fouling on the cages. The Star K is a poly type material and then we, we have also used this uh, Sapphire Ultra Core which has a stainless steel wire that goes through it as well. With both these uh, uh, advances in technology in netting, uh, basically you know, our containment has gone you know, almost 100 percent. There, unless there's a human error in in it, the uh, the there there is the ability to maintain the spec of what you're you purchased to begin with. So the the room that the the, the fish have in the cage, the um, difficulty predators would have of getting in, the amount of protection you have for storms has increased exponentially with being able to use engineered materials designed for us not trying to use something that was designed for the fishing industry into our industry. So technology has just leapt in the last couple of years. What's allowed us to be able to go to these materials and have zero anti fouling on any of our nets is net washing technology. And without the offshore oil industry developing ROVs, we probably would have never got to the spot where we were able to use uh, net washing technology. So we do have what we call RONCs, which is uh, basically underwater ROVs with net washing technology that we wash, able to wash all of our nets with now. And we do that on a consistent scheduled basis so that we never have fouling on the nets. So you don't have the weight on the cage, you don't have the weight on the nets. It's improved the industry by leaps and bounds just in the last five years because of these new technologies. Um, Focus on fish health, uh, I'll just leave it at that. Obviously, we are farmers, so we have to keep, uh, you know, that's our primary goal is to keep our fish healthy and happy, allow them to get to market uh, as quickly as possible. Partnerships and innovation. So I just wanted to, to, to quickly mention, obviously, we're very involved in, in R&D, uh, both locally in the Northeast, uh, nationally, uh, federally here in the U.S., as well as internationally. Um, we. Uh, believe strongly in partnering with uh, institutions and with uh, with people who want to do real applied research into to industry. Uh, for instance, here is a picture. This was the announcements for the NSERC. That's the uh, uh, Nat National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada. It's the uh, Cook Out Culture Industry Partner in the in the NSERC industry. Research Chair in Sustainable Agriculture at Dalhousie University. Uh, as we heard last night in, in the talk last night, Dalhousie has, has really leapt ahead in ocean research and has put a primary uh, stamp on, on what they're doing. And we're proud to be part of that. Um, we work very diligently with them. Uh, I will say that we have worked uh, very hard with uh, and, and very well with uh, people here in Maine at the University of Maine as well with Ian Bricknell and Debbie Bouchard and many, many more on projects here uh, that would benefit not just us but will benefit uh, basically anybody coming into this industry and, and other industries as well because the more work we do together, the better off we are. One last point before I get hauled off by the hook. Um, we talked about uh, sharing research and, and doing things so we don't have to duplicate them and, and sharing our intellectual uh, power. Because we are small, I'll go to the last one, we, are, we come from a small spot and we grow to, to a large. Because we are small as a region, um, but we have a lot of potential to grow. We have, and in order to reach that potential, we need to do it together. One of the things that we talked about is uh, obviously for us as a company, I operate on both, both sides of the border. I deal with a lot of regulatory agencies on both sides. And what happens is you end up doing research to satisfy a regulatory agent on one side of the border, then you have to do the exact same research on the opposite side of the border. And so it's, it's really helpful to get 
uh, that communication and that uh, joint project between uh, learning institutions and, and scientists as you do that research then it's accepted on both sides and that really helps uh, cut some of the red tape down and allows us to facilitate uh, quicker allows us to use the resources better well, it, it makes no sense to redo the same research twice so let's let's use that time and expertise to do something different and, and bring us that much farther ahead thank you very much yeah.